Hello everyone, this is Eva Nolik smith with Yoga You Online and I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you to today's talk with Olga Cable. Olga is a yoga therapist trained in the Vini Yoga tradition and she is also the founder of Sequence Wrists, an online yoga sequence builder for yoga teachers which has a wealth of wonderful resources and practice ideas olga welcome thank you so much for joining us today thank you so excited to be here so um we're here to talk about how we can make yoga more accessible to everybody and that as we know is a big theme of discussion in the yoga community these days um, and also later in our talk i want to explore some of the specific work you've been doing in this area because you're doing some really interesting stuff but saying oh we don't just need yoga adaptations to make yoga more accessible there's actually ways to adapt yoga poses so we can vary the specific benefits according to what we want to effect we want to create. So more on that later. Uh, but first off, um, when we're talking about making yoga more accessible to everybody, there are really um, a couple of statistics that I find really interesting. Um, we know that about 36 million people practice uh, yoga in the US alone. That's from the last survey by Yoga Alliance and Yoga Journal on Yoga in America. And we also know that three quarters of people, three out of four Americans um, say that yoga has, you know, is really healthy for good for your body, good for your mind. And even the most interesting statistic is that one in three Americans who are not currently practicing yoga um, are saying that they would like to try to practice within the next year. So uh, if you're a yoga teacher or a yoga studio, that obviously is a tremendous opportunity. So that's the good news. The bad news is that unfortunately, a large portion of the people who are interested in starting yoga won't be able to really take up the practice, at least not in the way it's typically taught today. Um, yoga, as we know, is perceived as mainly being for the fit, young, athletic people. And unfortunately, the average yoga class is not necessarily uh, that accessible to the American body. Is that your experience? Um, definitely. And um, I believe that there may be a couple of sides um, to that story, right? On one hand, we have um, ideas that are being perpetuated via social media and magazine covers and all that uh, of, you know, you look at the stream of on, on Instagram and you see all those beautiful, intricate wrap around oneself yoga poses. Um, and that might be, look like art, but might also discourage some people from trying it because they appear too difficult, too intricate. Oh, I will never be able to do that sort of a thing. That's one side of it. And another side, uh, definitely if um, a student shows up, first of all, it takes, it takes courage. And it's a huge step for somebody to get you know, off the couch and just step their foot into the yoga studio, right? We shouldn't underestimate that. It takes work to make that first step. But once they get there, um, a lot of people don't quite know what to expect, right? If they're new to it. So um, if they feel unwelcomed, if they feel like they cannot keep up, if they feel like mm -hmm. it's difficult for them, if they feel like they will hurt themselves, so all those things um, come together to create an impression of the first practice, you know, the first or the second or the third class. Right. So if we as yoga teachers don't make them feel welcome and included in everything that we do and uh, welcomed with all their limitations, whatever they are, physical or mental, um, then it will be hard for them to continue, right? It will be hard for them to come back. It's 
in, in Lean Yoga, sometimes we talk about the hook. And it applies both for private yoga sessions and for classes as well. When somebody tries something for the very first time uh, and have that experience, it's nice if they experience a hook, something that really captures their attention, like captivates them and sparks their excitement. Um, and it can be different types of hooks uh, that we can present in a yoga class. It can be uh, um, and it, um, a sense of accomplishment that they get from trying something and saying, oh, look, wow, I could do it. It can be the sense of getting out of my head, right? This, uh, throughout the class and at the end of the class, they feel, oh, wow, I really was able to disconnect from my spinning mind. Or if they feel like their body feels really good at the end of the class compared to how it felt when they came in. So it's all those little things that we can implement um, to help them feel more comfortable, um, feel more accepted, and feel like they're getting, getting something out of it, right? right? Right from the start. Right, right. So just as an example, I think we, we have a Facebook group uh, on yoga teaching methodology. Um, on Facebook and one of the issues that people bring up most often is when they're teaching mixed level classes. So they have their regular students who you know know the routine, who are you know fairly adept at their practice, who come with a certain set of expectations and those are of course the students do you want to make sure you keep happy because they're your regulars. And then you have the newbie coming in with not that much experience. So how, how would you go about, what's the kind of hook that you, as part of the practice, can help make that student feel comfortable and feel included? To me, it, it seems like relevance is the key, right? So every yoga practice that you teach needs to be relevant, both to the newcomer and the person who's been coming for a long time, right? So there are some basic ideas that you want to teach your yoga students that are already familiar to those who've been coming for a while. And that's fine. It might seem like da 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 repetitive, a little repetitive for the new uh, for uh, recurring students. But um, something um, will always be relevant to people. Right, so it depends on how you structure your practice, and this is where the idea that's mm -hmm. fundamental to the yoga tradition comes into place, and that's an intention. Right, mm -hmm. what kind of intention are you setting for this practice? Right, mm -hmm. will you be focusing on a particular area of the body? Right, mm -hmm. even the person who's been coming to you for months, they still get hip tension, they still get neck tension especially if they work on the computer a lot. So working on particular body areas will be relevant to anybody, newcomers and um, people who've been, who've been coming for a while. Do you want to explore an interesting pose? We call those pose-centric practices. So that basically means that you take a pose and you spend an entire practice preparing for it and approaching it from different interesting angles, right? So all those things, they keep people focused and keep their attention present. Mm -hmm. Or you might, your intention might be to focus on energetics. So then you would structure your practice in a way that will help people unwind if it's the end of the workday or if it will help energize them. Mm -hmm. so, or you can organize it about a specific idea, the specific idea of being grounded, for example, or the idea of the heart opening. Those are some of the more popular right. ones. Or right. it's something totally different. Right. So, but once you have that intention set and once you communicate that intention to the people, hopefully it will be relevant for them in that moment. Right. Mm -hmm. So it can serve as a, as a hook to keep their attention and um, see how they can use that basically in their daily life, how it's applicable in their daily life. Right. Right. Yeah. Really, really great points. Um, and to all of you listening in, thanks for your little comments and keep them coming. And also if you have questions, type them in the little feed at the bottom. We will um, try to get to questions as they come up. Um, so Olga, 
I love that idea of it sitting in intention and finding something that's relevant to everyone in sort of like a meta framework that doesn't just focus on like, here's a pose and we have to do this pose. And if you can't do the pose, then you have, have a defeat, you know, you get frustrated. Um, but let's say you start the class, you set a beautiful intention, you have something that everyone is motivated, like shoulder tension, neck tension, or heart opening. Um, and then you get to a pose like downward dog, which is, you know, really one of the most commonly taught yoga uh, poses in classes today. And you have the newbie student who is trying to, you know, you're trying not to get, get them frustrated. You're trying to give them a good experience, trying to make the class so that they don't experience defeat or don't defeat experience like yoga is, you know, difficult and not for me, which is the typical experience. Um, and at the same time, your typical yoga class contains poses that if you are beginners, if you have tight hamstrings, those poses will be very difficult. So how do you address that? Well, as yoga teachers, right, we're always watching the room, right, trying to get a sense for both what individual students are doing, but, and, but also um, what this group of students kind of is capable for, right? So um, if we're using an example of downward facing dog, right, the, the easiest thing to do is to encourage the newbies to bend the knees, right? So that they're not focused so much on trying to keep their legs straight, which will cause the rounding of the back and all that good stuff. Just bending the knees and lengthening from the palms into the tailbone, sometimes using specific cues will help, you know, change people's experience uh, and we'll need to kind of say the same thing several different times to see what clicks with them. Or we can ask those students to put their hands on the wall, right, and explain why this is a better option. So mm -hmm. when, um, I like to use this principle when I'm looking around the room is, um, I usually choose those adaptations depending on what I see and what I know about the students, right? What I see is when you look around the room and you see where people, A, are not getting the benefit from the pose, right, uh, that we're after, and B, where people are not safe when they're trying to attempt a pose. Mm -hmm. So what we do then is to see how we can modify the shape of the pose for that particular person on maybe the entire class, if we have five out of seven people who are struggling with a particular pose, mm -hmm. right? How can we do to make it safe, right? Mm -hmm. Or safer at least, so they don't have hurt themselves. And then at the same time, how we can make them experience the same benefit as everybody else in the room, right? Mm -hmm. With downward facing dog, it can be different ideas that we are after. We might be focusing on lengthening the spine, right? If that's our intention, then bend, generously bending the knees is not going to make a difference mm -hmm. because they will still be able to lengthen their spine, even more so if they bend the knees. Mm -hmm. If our goal is to stretch the hamstrings, for example, it would, it would be more effective for them to put their hands on the wall or the chair mm -hmm. and focus on stretching of the hamstrings. So the choice of adaptation or pose variation will also depend on those two factors, safety, and then the type of benefit that we're after, right? And because of that, sometimes you might even offer them a totally different pose that's not necessarily the downward facing dog if, they're, if we are looking at the benefit as opposed to just the, the shape of the pose specifically. Right. And this, in my tradition, this is a very important idea. We always talk about form versus function, right? Mm -hmm. It's not as important what the pose looks like. You need to be safe while you're in it, right? But it's much more important what you're getting out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of mentioned that before. We don't show up in yoga classes to arrange our bodies in those particular shapes just mm -hmm. for the sake of those shapes, right? I mean, what's the point? We, show, we do that for the purpose of accomplishing something, for getting to manifesting the intention, right? To getting some benefits out of those <laughs> physical body arrangements. 
So function over form always, and then arranging, changing the form of the pose so that we could get the benefit that we're after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's a, a really nice um, new take on it that you don't so much teach in terms of now we're doing downward dog, but more now we're doing a pose that can help stretch tight hamstrings or help lengthen your spine. Um, exactly. But then the next issue that we run into as teacher is that students come to class and they've seen the picture perfect downward dog on Instagram. <laughs> and that's the pose they feel they have to do. So <laughs> when you give a modification, generally speaking, they feel like they're in school and they just were given a C plus. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it can happen. Absolutely. And I think in situations like that, it might help to explain um, what is the downside of trying to do the pose without um, um, forgetting the safety of it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, still, the bottom line is that people want to be safe. Nobody wants to hurt themselves. And if we help them understand that, uh, you know, insisting on keeping the legs straight the downward facing dog will round the back right which can create tension in the neck which can also create tension in the lower back we really don't want that our goal is to accomplish this and this so let's do this for that so this is kind of I, I try to um when i teach classes and when students insist <laughs> on doing specific poses a specific way i try to explain uh, my um reasoning basically why i believe this would be a better version for them or for the entire class I and mean, it depends what we're doing and um, often i tie it back to our intention right remember how we wanted to accomplish this um, at the beginning of the class so if we do it this way then it will help us move toward that intention mm. Yeah, that's nice. And on a practical level, do you start with uh, variations of the pose that are pretty much everyone can do and then gradually build on that rather than start with a difficult version and then downgrading for the people who can do the difficult version? <laughs> it depends, right? It depends on the situation. Generally mm -hmm. speaking, I prefer to start with the easiest, right? For let's start here. Okay, if you want it. If you want to take it one step further, you can, you know, do this. If you want to take it one step further, try and see how it feels. So, um, because I believe that then the, the, people, the people will self-select and some of them will stay with the first version of the pose. Some will take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. Others will, you know, try to take it further, but we still have to watch <laughs> and make sure that they take it to the, to the next level safely. Right, right. Yeah. In, in, in my tradition, when we do poses like that, a lot of poses um, in their initial form are already adapted to the, so that the majority of people could do them. For example, if we're doing Uchita Trikanasana, we won't start with people placing their hands on the floor in a triangle pose, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's strong. It's, it's very strong for most people. So uh, why set up our students for failure, right? We mm -hmm. want to set them up for success. Mm -hmm. So we want to start with the version that's uh, easiest and still accomplishes the goal that we're after, right? Mm -hmm. And then maybe progressively take it further, whether in the space of one class or over time. It just it depends on what we see in front mm -hmm. of ourselves. Right, right. And, and one of the things I love about your work uh, in this area is that you, and this will be my last question, and then we can uh, take a little um, uh, time to look at questions from people who are listening in. Um, but you were saying that pose adaptations are not just to make the poses more accessible to people. Pose adaptations really serve a whole other uh, purpose that we're not paying enough attention to. So could you talk about that? Absolutely. And it stems from this idea that uh, 
we emphasize function over form, right? So the main point here is that asanas are not viewed as the destination, but rather as a tool to get to some place, right? To get so so basically every yoga teacher has a toolbox mm -hmm. and all those different techniques and things, including yoga poses. So you, when you practice your yoga, you're doing it for you, right? As a practitioner, not for some um, you know vague idea of what the pose should look like or anything right. like that. So poses are tools. And if you have a tool, right, how can you use this tool to maximize your intention? And that's why we can take a pose such mm -hmm. as Nirvadrasana, a warrior one, right? We're all familiar with a traditional version of the pose. Usually your arms are up, your chest is lifted, one foot is, you know, in front of the other. So in the yoga tradition, we have, last time I counted, maybe 22 different versions of this pose. And a lot of times you can just modify the position of the arm. So mm -hmm. if you just bring one arm up, you will be emphasizing the stretch through the side of the torso and into your hip flexors, right? So the, all the main structure of the pose will be the same, but just by changing one arm position, right? You will create, place a different emphasis and create, give it a different flavor to the pose, right? Mm -hmm. If you bring your arms out, and then bring them in, you'll be emphasizing what's going on in your upper back. So you'll be working on releasing tension in your upper back. Mm -hmm. You can work with your neck. You can work with different arm positions to emphasize different parts of your lower back, mm -hmm. uh, of your upper back, excuse me. So it's de depending on placement of your limbs, <laughs> you will emphasize different aspects of the pose, which will have different impacts. Right, so it becomes um, particularly useful if you're working with a specific body area. Right, mm -hmm. for example, um, you can use pretty much any pose to work on your neck and upper back. Right, by changing how you use your arms or how you, mm -hmm. you know, position your upper body. So, um, in that way, yoga poses become tools, and it's particularly useful, for example, if you're working toward um, a particular more challenging pose. Mm -hmm. You can um, use specific pose adaptations that will prepare your body better mm -hmm. more for a more challenging pose. Right. And one right. thing that I wanted to mention, um, since uh, in the in introduction we talked a little about um, more difficult poses and easier poses, I like to differentiate those into two camps. And I call them one workhorse poses and other ones show horse poses <laughs> that are beautiful and interesting right. the ones that you see in your instagram feed those are the standing splits the dancers the wrap around oneself sort of poses and they're beautiful and they have great benefits if you can get yourself into them space <laughs> and get them out get yourself out of them <laughs> exactly and the other category is the workhorse poses, I call them. The, those are do all the heavy lifting, meaning those poses are not so fancy, right? But they are the ones that you can um, adapt very well, that you can, um, most people will do them. And actually I came to call those poses, not just workhorse poses, but super poses as well. Because just like superfoods that have, they are very benefit dense, right? Uh, they are very um, nutrient dense. Superposes are benefit dense, meaning that we can get so much out of those poses, like your Vajrasana or you know the bridge or the cobra or all those different things mm -hmm. um, on how we use them within a practice, mm -hmm. right? In one practice, you can use your cobra to work on your neck. In another practice, you might use your cobra to work on stability of your pelvis, right? In another practice, you might use cobra to work on your hamstring. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So that way, you don't have to constantly come up with this, those intricate, fantastic poses for, for your mm -hmm. practice. You can just take 
those, I, I made a list of 20, those okay. 20 super poses and yeah. adapt them in a way uh, that will address pretty much any physical issue, prepare for any difficult pose. Um, so um, it also makes it easier for a yoga teacher so you don't have to hold in your head the content of all 100, I don't know, 200 possible right. yoga poses, right? Right, right. You've got 20 that you're working with, and then you yeah. sprinkle it every now and again with more difficult, more challenging show horse poses. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point also in terms of um, pose adaptations and making yoga more accessible because those workhorse poses are also, for the most part, the poses that are more easy for people, uh, even, uh, beginners particularly, to, to work with. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're extremely excited because you have a course coming up uh, on Yoga U um, about pose adaptations and making yoga more accessible to everybody, particularly looking into this area of uh, benefit dense poses and how we can work with various adaptations for different benefits. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what you'll be covering? Absolutely. So what I try to do in this course is to kind of lay things out from the ground up, meaning um, identifying what adaptations are, right? How we can use them, why do we use them, what kind of benefit we can expect to derive from them. Uh, Clearly, um, like we mentioned earlier, for the purposes of adapting practices for specific physical limitations, right? But also for the purposes of, uh, for, for other purposes, for example, uh, for specific structural benefits, like targeting specific body areas. Or we can use those poses to keep students' attention, like we said, because if your students know what your Virabhadrasana one, warrior one, should look like. Once they get into it, their mind starts drifting in all the different places. They, it's easy to go onto autopilot when your brain knows what to expect, what the pose looks like, and once it gets there. With yeah. yoga adaptation, if you have no idea what the teacher is going to ask you to do with your arm, you're forced to pay attention. So it's yeah. another one of those attention hooks that keeps yeah. people engaged, right? Keeps them present in their bodies because yeah. they don't know what's coming next. Right. Um, there are also other reasons why we do. Of course, we can use adaptations to make the pose more or less challenging, right? Um, um, other reasons for energetic effects and things like that. So in this course, I was trying to lay that all out, the reasoning behind using um, adaptations with lots and lots of examples of specific adaptations, how we do them, why we do them, in what situations, for what purposes, and also to help a teacher select how do you know which adaptation to choose, right? How do you decide? And so the whole second part of the course is dedicated specifically for that. We're in different areas, uh, different three specific strategies that I'm covering. Um, so how to select a specific adaptation uh, that will be relevant to your students and will drive your intention home <laughs> in your yoga class. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Um, and it's a, really a different take on teaching. I think for some poses, you have like up to 20 different variations that so it's, it's and the sky is the limit, right? Because human movement potential is limitless, right. right? But I also have some cautions about using, being, getting too creative with adaptations as well, because we have to be mindful about certain things. Um, right. Yeah, can get too crazy with those either. <laughs> <laughs> as is human nature. Uh, <laughs> So I'm just looking back through here. Um, Tom wants to know, where does Olga teach? Is she in Russia? <laughs> <laughs> I moved here 20 years ago. So now I live in Portland, Oregon, and I have a small studio. But you still have your lovely Russian, <laughs> Russian accent. <laughs> uh, Daphne is saying, thank you for this presentation. Sandra is saying, 
mixed class issues are my biggest problem. Thank you for going over this. Uh, Helen is saying thank you for the information and helpful um, information. Uh, Daphne is asking, how would you start with the easiest variation of downward dog on the wall? Would you just, and then second question, would you describe the steps that you would use to make it increasingly difficult? So progression in downward dog pose. So downward dog is an interesting pose. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the yoga tradition and myself personally, we actually rarely use that pose because there's so many things that can go wrong, especially for beginners. So I find that uh, a good introduction for into downward facing dog is actually to use it as a transition, right? So if you've done something on your in the kneeling position, right? Let's say you were you started the class seated, then you did some kneeling stuff, and you need to transition up into standing. So you can start on your hands and knees, kind of lift the knees off the ground, push the butt back, and walk your hands towards your feet, right, and end up into standing. That's the first kind of like primary <laughs> thing, how you can start with downward facing dog, introducing it in general, right? Or you can have people pause there for in, in downward dog for a breath or two and kind of assess where they are with that pose. Um, have them bend the knees if necessary, things like that. So um, that would be a good start to just kind of assess where students are and then after you do your standing pose, let's say you could do the downward facing dog at the wall, placing the hands on the wall and lengthening back chair works really well as well. Um, and you can do some stuff in the standing position too that also prepares people for downward facing dog. It's important to analyze the pose itself, the biomechanical demands of the pose. So what do we need for downward facing dog? We need to lengthen the spine. So we need to do some other poses that also create that spinal elongation. We need to make sure that they can raise the arms in this position. So doing some other poses that will prepare your arms for that will be useful as well. We need to stretch their hamstrings clearly a little bit so you can do other stuff, some standing poses, even poses like Trikonasana, for example, will still help stretch the hamstrings and other standing forward bends and stuff like that. So, so if you really want to explore downward facing dog with your students, this is kind of the progression that you can take. Prepare other separate body parts for that pose in standing, and then take them from, you can start with their hands on the back of the chair, right? Then take their hands to the seat of the chair, then take their hands down to the blocks, then take their hands down to the floor. If, you, if that's if that's how you want to structure your practice, right? And it can be a fun thing to do for the entire practice, right? Start, um, build the entire practice around downward dog exploration. I think in the past I've done it before and it's actually fun, right? Because right. it helps people understand the little parts, all the details that go into the pose, practice those details in other poses and then put them together in the downward facing dog. It's not like you're going to do that every time, right? right? But at least if you want like a good introduction and like in depth dive into that pose or any other pose, it would be the same idea, right? Mm -hmm. You have to prepare different body parts for more challenging poses. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And downward dog is um, such an interesting pose and such a difficult pose because there's both the biomechanical aspects of, you know, when you have tight hamstrings, how it translates into the pose. And then there are specific actions that people have to be able to master to really find that length in the spine and pushing out through the arms rather than sinking forward into putting all the weight in the hands. And so it's, it's a really complex pose on so many different levels. And I, I think, uh, for some reason, it has been uh, lumped right in there with all the easy beginning poses. <laughs> correct, correct. So that's why downward facing dog is not actually included with my super poses. Because I think that um, I always assess risk versus benefit, right? For me, in downward facing dog, for newbies, for beginner students, risks outweigh the benefits. 
That's why um, I usually ap approach it very carefully, usually just as a transi transition tool to begin with. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, you can play with it too. You can, if people can do planks, you can move in and out from plank into downward facing dog. Also helps them get a sense of where the body weight goes, mm -hmm. how the weight should be distributed, right? So take the load off the hamstrings and then challenge them again. So things like that. Mm, yeah, nice point. All right, I think we have time for uh, one last question. Um, let's see. Um, can bridge pose, Marie is asking, can bridge pose be adapted to a student sitting in a chair? <laughs> That's tricky. <laughs> so here's the, the, the point. Remember how we were talking about the benefits of the pose. So what are we trying to accomplish with a bridge pose? And there are different things that we can try to do, right? But generally speaking, we're trying to strengthen or contract the posterior structures of the body like the upper, lower back, glutes, and hamstrings, like so all the posterior structures, and we're trying to stretch the front of the body, right, to lengthen. So if we approach it from that perspective, then we can analyze it, which seated poses, you can, you're not gonna lie your students down on the back on the chair, right? That's just not safe, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. So which other poses can accomplish the same benefit? If they're just sitting in the chair, if they put their hands behind their back and they're lifting their chest up, will they get the stretch? They will get the stretch maybe in the chest and their belly, but not so much in their hamstrings. Okay, what if you bend one knee and stick the foot under the chair, right? And try to do the same thing again. Will they get a stretch now in the hip flexors as well? Yes, they will, right? So then you end up breaking the bridge pose down in like pieces again. So you one pose in the chair to stretch the front of the chest and then use another pose in the chair to stretch the hip flexors or something like that. Yeah. So that's why it's actually it can be so, so interesting to create chair yoga practices. I know sometimes when people work with chair poses, it can get repetitive and somewhat boring because there's a limit of um, things that you can do while seated in the chair. But if you approach it from the perspective, okay, how can I break the bridge down, for example, into two or three chair poses so they get the same benefit? It becomes more interesting, it becomes more interesting for you, it becomes more interesting for them, and right. they get the same benefit as they would if they could do the bridge on the floor. Right, right, yes, beautiful point. Great, good. Um, we reached the end of our time. Uh, one last point or one last comment from Jacqueline. Uh, she's saying downward facing dog is overrated and too heavily relied on in most classes. It's not easy. It should just be a transition between poses, if at all. I teach a hands-free class, minimal weight bearing on hands, wrists, and arms. The biomechanics of down dog can be accessed in other poses with far less risk. So e echoing your, your <laughs> yes. I, I think it's something that many yoga teachers observe, right? Because downward dog is such a standard part of the yoga teaching repertoire. It takes a little gut to say, no, I'm not gonna teach that in a class with a lot of beginners. Um, Every so. book has a place. And again, they're tools, right? Right. Are they helping us advance our intentions? Are they helping our students' bodies evolve in a positive way? If not, then, then why, why use it? <laughs> why? Right, very good point. Good. Well, Olga, thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights. You're such a great uh, deep thinker with lots of insights out, outside the box, which I really like. <laughs> So thanks Thank for sharing your, your, great, uh, your great insights with us. And uh, we'll look forward to rejoining you on the course. And I'm looking forward to that as well. And everyone listening in, thanks so much for joining us. Um, if you want the recording of the talk, um, you can, we'll be putting a link in, um, in the comment section where you can send us an email and uh, we'll send you a recording of the talk as well if you want that. All right, good. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And Olga, a very warm thank you to you.
Thank you. Bye.